Experiments in Physics with Dr. Frank Oppenheimer. A brief demonstration of the equipment used in the Library of Experiments in Physics produced in cooperation with University of Colorado Television. Today's experiment. In this experiment, one can study the electric field which is produced by a changing magnetic flux. The magnetic flux is produced inside this long solenoid, um, which has three layers, which can be connected either one layer at a time, from here to here, or all three layers in parallel, which is the way it's connected now. If one wants to have just one layer, one removes some of the straps on this end of it. You, you can, of course, also connect the layers in series, but then you have to pay attention to which way the current is going in each layer if you're going to m make sense out of the results. Uh, you can count the number of turns per centimeter on this particular coil. The total number of turns is given, so you can simply have to get the measure the length in order to c calculate the number of turns per, turns per meter. The changing flux is produced by first running a current through here and then re suddenly reducing the voltage to zero by shorting together these two leads right here. This lead that comes in and this one um, are shorted together by this switch over here. Uh, when that happens, of course, the current continues to run for a while because the magnetic field in here collapses. And it's that collapsing magnetic field then which produces the changing magnetic flux. However, it's a completely calculable one from the uh, number of turns, the resistance of the coil, and the um, area on, of the solenoid or the diameter, all of which you'll have to measure. Um, inside, in order to notice the effects of that flux, we have several different loops of wire. Um, there will be an electric, as the flux decreases through here, there'll be an electric field developed, and the line integral of that electric field around some path will give an EMF, which is then measured on the scope. The, um, there are several coils. This one is a full circle, two leads coming out the bottom. This one is simply a straight wire across the diameter with the two leads coming out along the side of this board one along this side and the other along this side. Um, and then on the back side of this, there are um, also two coils, a half circle, which goes like this with the leads coming out together. And on the other side of the board, the bottom of it, a semicircle which starts on a lead over here, comes around and comes out on another lead here. These wide leads are on the median plane when this is set in the, uh, in here, that median plane has been adjusted, so it really is the median plane of the solenoid. Uh, the leads all come out to these terminals. You can then follow them through the selector switch uh, and see which con is connected from the little contacts on the selector switch to the slide contacts which connect to these two terminals here, and they go to the scope. Um, there are markings on the front here, um, which sometimes get displaced, but which show which coil is connected. But I certainly would check uh, the wiring to make sure you know what's happening. When this is on the very flat coil, um, which is in the median plane, uh, you, should, you can check whether it's on the median plane by raising and lowering this very slightly and, and taking readings at various positions and seeing if that has any effect and what the effect is. Um, we've tried to get it as close as possible, but it's not exact. Um, the coil is energized by a power supply, a DC power supply. One first turns on the AC, and then be sure the variac is down, and then uh, turns on the DC and raises the voltage on the coil in order to see that, the switch has to be in the down, unshorted position, and one raises on the voltage of the coil to about 15 volts. And reads that quite carefully, and there's a vernier, so you can set it. And of course, as the, as the 
coil warms up, that may change, and if you want to keep it at a constant voltage, you'll have to check it every once in a while. Uh, those meters are now moving around a little bit uh, because we took the faces off in order to cut down the gain, but this is a regulated power supply and it will keep the voltage um, of the power supply quite constant. Current goes through this limiting resistor, goes through the ammeter, but now the ammeter has a shunt across it because when we short out the wires, the current will go way up. Notice that the current goes up and we don't want this to go off scale. So in order to read it, you have to push this button which removes the shunt and we see that there's about 4.4 amperes at 15 volts in this particular coil with all three layers in parallel. So you can calculate the resistance of the coil. Um, then um, let's watch what happens here again when I raise this switch. As I raise it, and this is a mercury switch, so one has to raise it slowly to keep the mercury from splashing. At some point, the voltage goes right to zero. And when I put it down again, the current starts running through the coil. Since the current is large, when it's shorted out, I wouldn't leave it in the shorted out position any longer than necessary, because things will get unnecessarily hot. So that's what we will want to look at at the scope. We will want to look at the voltage developed when I short out the coil. The scope is set so that we have a differential amplifier. The reason for the differential amplifier is that we're looking at low voltages, and these exposed wires can pick up a lot of AC. If I put this on a fairly high gain and, and look at the trace, let me put it on free, uh, free running for a minute, and then ground one side of that, you can see even at half a volt, uh, you can see a very wiggly trace, which is due to the AC. So we use the differential amplifier to keep that smooth. But we want to look at much more sens sensitive positions, say 2 millivolts uh, per division. I don't know what's making that peak at the moment. Uh, something in the power supply. Well, that's not uh, an abnormality that just occurred here. We won't pay any attention to it. Um, now I can get a trace on that. Let me put it back on the here and put it on the single sweep at ready to position. And now when I short this out, I should be able to see a trace. Let me try it. Yes, I get a pulse. That same little bump is there, but that is not normally there. It's some aberration which has just occurred. I get various traces, and I can locate the spot. I want to locate it exactly at some position here. Then I'll measure voltage from there down and voltage from here over. I can still see that little spike there, which is presumably some odd pickup, which happens just in this room, perhaps from the television cameras. Um, so now I'm ready to make a measurement. I'll put it over on store and erase it briefly. And now I'll try raising the switch slowly and watch at the same instant that the voltage drops to zero, I should be able to see the, the trace appear where well, it isn't ready. There. I again get that spike, but that's irrelevant. And I'm sure it has to do with the TV equipment. Let's try it again and see how reproducible it is. At least the main part of the trace, not the bump. Yes. That time the bump was absent. Um, notice at the beginning here, let me in increase the intensity just for the TV once, and you can see that at the beginning there's an oscillation and it's hard to see what the voltage is. Um, I'll turn that back down again. That can be overcome by using a much higher time speed, say 10 times as fast, instead of one millisecond, 10 millisecond. Now I'll try it. another sweep. And I get a line which comes across here. Of course, I have to have enough intensity to give my writing speed. And it comes across, and I can project it back and see very closely what the voltage will be was at the time it, it triggered. So I have an accurate measurement of the peak voltage from where my spot was located to where this trace comes in. But to measure the time constant, 
I'll have to use this one, which was at one millisecond. I'll divide that voltage by three and then see at exactly what point the amplitude was uh, one over E rather, not one, one third, exactly one over E times the peak amplitude. And if I look here, it comes out about five milliseconds under these conditions. I can do the same thing with another coil. I can go to, say, one of the half coils. I can again do this. I may have to cut down the level a little bit in order that it triggers at the smaller voltage. And then I, it wasn't quite enough. You see, it didn't trigger. I'll cut down the level a little more. And now I got the triggering, which occurred for half a coil. Again, I get that little oscillation, but by going to the very high speed, I can, again, get a straight line across. And from those two, I can get both the voltage and the time for any conditions of the coil. So I can vary the voltage, I can vary the number of layers, I can vary the loop, and I can see how this EMF, both in, in magnitude and in decay time, varies under these conditions and understand quite thoroughly what's happening inside the solenoid. When I'm not actually making a measurement, I want to be sure to keep these on the nun store since the life of these tubes is at best limited and goes down rapidly in the store position. That's all I think that one needs to know to do and make the measurements on this experiment. Experiments in Physics with Dr. Frank Oppenheimer was produced in cooperation with University of Colorado Television. This is University of Colorado Television.